and uh, Slashdot just got to it. So anyway. Uh, so anyway, if you were to work on personalized enhancement, what sort of things would you need? What is your shopping list going to look like if you were to say, screw the business model, that'll figure itself out. Let me just get started and work on things. Well, you might want some DNA sequencers. You might want DNA synthesizers. You might want microscopes. You know, a microscope would be nice to have in general. Um, well, people are already starting to work on these uh, different projects. They are already open source hardware projects. You can, like the RepRap, go online and get these uh, plans and schematics. And I'm just going to go briefly through all of these. And uh, you might spot something you like, maybe not. So anyway, much less developed than, you know, if you looked at the US patent system, there's many millions of patents. And so there's not quite the selection that you'd see in the US patent system, but the alternative is that all of these are available to download and to make yourself. Uh, there's also software projects, of course, in any open source community. So for instance, CAD, we need viable replacements for SolidWorks and AutoCAD and Pro Engineer and so on. So there are also CAD programs. Um, but not just for giant macro-mechanical projects, but also nanotechnology projects. Um, I'm pleased to also quasi-announce that uh, the original developer of NanoEngineer, uh, NanoRex, uh, when, they went, when they closed down a few years ago, they had released a open source nanotechnology molecular machinery CAD program. Uh, so anyway, the entire development history of it has now been released, and so the project can, can continue without uh, NanoRex being around. So that's very important so that we get an open source start to nanotechnology. If molecular machines are going to be created, I want to have one. So um, with all these different hardware projects out there, um, we need help with aggregating all of them and uh, making practical use of them. So the basic concept that I always like to apply in this area is the idea of bringing software development methods to hardware. Um, hardware development is always a bit peculiar to me because when I go look at companies and so on and how they use PDM, it's really broken. Um, and maybe I'm just more used to software projects, but in terms of collaboration and so on, sharing with a large team of mechanical engineers your projects from files and so on is very difficult. Um, transhumanists tend to be on the cutting edge of technology, uh, so there's perhaps some order that we could bring to the chaos. So what you can do if you want to really get involved in making the future is go join a hackerspace in your area. There's many of them. I'm sure you have one near you. And if you don't, you have people near you who want to make one. A hackerspace is a public space where people can come to make and learn just about anything. Uh, it's usually open during the day and you can come and work on your projects. Uh, they hold classes. And uh, there's a great deal of uh, fun activities planned. Uh, one of them is BioCurious, which does not actually have a physical space yet, but it was started by Joseph Jackson, who spoke yesterday. Um, he is a transhumanist who wanted to start a hackerspace specifically for do-it-yourself biology, uh, and specifically for people who didn't really want to start a biotech startup, um, and instead be a bit more public about their development and work, and who didn't need a private warehouse or something to spend money on. So they got funding, and uh, they're starting with only $35,000. They were aiming for 30. Um, there's also a video that I would play, but since the internet connection doesn't work here, uh, I won't. Uh, so you should make stuff. And if you need anything from me to get started, you should, you should ask. Uh, there's my contact information. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Brian. And we've got time for a question if someone has one. Can you, summari can, can you summarize, Professor Jonathan Post speaking, uh, my son is a patent attorney at the age of 21 because he started with a double BS in computer science and mathematics, but having a law degree is good. I defer to him for explaining patent law, but for the sake of the audience, both here and, and out in the virtual world, what is the important difference between copyright and patent, and how must we overcome that difference? 
Well, the important difference for people who are out and building different inventions that they want to share is that patent law is not immediate. I'm sorry, patents are not immediately granted to you. Um, now, from a not from a bystander stand point of view, the difference between patents and copyright is that copyright is purportedly for works of literature and art and media and uh, text and so on. Whereas in invention, or I'm sorry, whereas in patent law, there's specifically the USPTO set up to moderate over inventions of the physical realm. So the line is kind of blurry there. Um, and that's actually why we have software patents, because they didn't really know, well, is this a real an invention that we should patent or not? Um, and so that's why um, uh, like the summary for a patent or something is a government granted exclusive monopoly on it. It's purely in the sense of, of business for a limited period of time, hopefully. Right. <laughs>